All right, Mike here on guns, cars, and digits. Um, let's try and one take a video here about methanol as a fuel. Okay. So here's a basic concept. Methane is a readily occurring compound in the Earth's environment. And it's 26 times the greenhouse gas that carbon dioxide is. So if you have a methane um, developing point, it is better from a climate standpoint to convert it to CO2. Okay. What are other supporting clauses for this track? Well... You have to make electricity through solar means, about 15% efficient, but you have to share a commodity, um, the stuff that goes in the battery, you have to share that in an international way. So that spreads a disease and it causes an exchange of finances in a potentially less than ideal way. Whereas making methanol is something that any country can do on their own with their own resources. So you convert from methane to methanol. The methanol is no longer a greenhouse item and you can use it for following chemical processes. That's the value right there. Um, historically, we have this graph here, uh, it's fuel energy density by mass, okay, so you divide the amount of energy that the fuel has available by how much that fuel weighed, and hydrogen kind of comes out looking great, and then um, kind of painstakingly, you have the lithium ion battery and methanol being some of the lower ones on the chart. And nitromethane being uh, worse than methanol, interestingly enough. When you come back and you look at methanol energy in terms of the amount of space that the fuel takes up, the lithium ion still looks bad. You have all the hydrocarbons that look promising. And then you have nitromethane and methanol again lower than the rest of the hydrocarbons. But these look at the fuel alone, just the fuel. They don't take into account the engine that's going to use the fuel to complete the process. So, we end up with this chart. Okay, engines work by taking in a certain amount of air, we mix it with fuel, and it does what we want it to do. Uh, this chart represents that outcome. Uh, also, in some cases, the fuel takes up part of the air that the engine would, uh, would take in. This has to take that into account. All chips in, methanol ends up actually being the best combustion fuel that, that is more or less known to man. Uh, I did not include nitromethane because that's a more complicated chemical it has more than one uh, it has more than three species of atom involved so uh, this is one of those things uh, why we can't have nice things this is why so um, <clears throat> for what it's worth methanol ends up being a performer now look very closely at the chart octane gives you a coefficient of performance of one okay if you have a 400 horsepower engine and you multiply it by one, then you end up with 400 horsepower because the engine was designed to run on octane as a fuel. If you switch to methanol, you multiply your existing horsepower, in this case 400, and you multiply it by 1.13, and you end up with a 440 horsepower setup. Okay, how does methanol add performance to your engine. Well, if you sit there and you do the chemistry for it, 
methanol makes about 7% more than gasoline. But if you actually build an engine and run it on methanol, it performs better. And here's why, is that methanol burns cleanly. It is about the cleanest burning liquid fuel we've got. So this is the air that you breathe drawn to scale. You add the one methanol molecule to the six parts of air fuel mixture and you you end up with this event. And you have to go you have to undergo what's called ionization. Okay, whenever you strike the spark plug uh it ionizes the the mixture. What that means is you no longer have methanol. It breaks one of the hydrogen atoms off. And when you break off a hydrogen atom like that, you have hydrogen in the ionized state. And it's ready to react with another chemical if the reaction is going to release energy. That's called exothermic. If it releases energy, it's exothermic. If it's endothermic, it takes energy to run. So if it's endothermic, a tiny little bit of chemical compound will be made and the rest of the chemical reaction will stop. In the case of methanol, because methanol combustion is an exothermic reaction, the reaction will continue. So these two hydrogen atoms are easy to break off and bond to this oxygen atom. So what happens is that you, you break apart this O2 molecule and you create H2O. And you have then ionized oxygen, which can re-stick to this methanol molecule that you've ionized into pieces which adds more energy to the system and completes the ionization process. It makes it possible to break off this um, HO molecule and this hydrogen atom, and you're going to end up with ionized carbon to react with this molecule. And so what it really wants is just the one oxygen atom, and then you end up with the with an ionized oxygen on the other side. And this uneven oxygen atom is always in the ionized state and it's able to react with any methanol molecules that are distributed out in, to other molecules in this system. Okay, so this is just one molecular event and then there would be billions just like it drawn in 3D space. And uh, speaking of 3D space, this is your air drawn in 2D space. If this were 3D space, this O2 molecule could potentially be closer to the methanol molecule, and then these nitrogen atoms would be in this plane, kind of on top of it. So this is why methanol burns so doggone cleanly. It's a very simple system. And if you don't believe that this is a simple system, this is gasoline. Gasoline is a much more complicated system. Okay. So, you first, the first step of combustion is you have to break off the hydrogen atoms, and they have to float in this sea of nitrogen in order to find a potential O2 molecule to react with. And then that energy has to be added to this system in order to ionize the, the black part, which is the carbon structure, in order to pyrolytically decompose that and react it with the remaining oxygen molecules. That's why fire uh, from normal hydrocarbons is yellow instead of blue. Okay, that all these carbon atoms that didn't quite burn properly, they glow yellow just like charcoal in a wood fire. Okay, and the reason that wood fire is interesting is because we're going to get back to it. Um, dimethyl ether, on a side note, is an offshoot of the methanol economy. So you can either make methanol or dimethyl ether throughout the processes. You can actually make methanol into dimethyl ether. You have the, you have the, 
the methyl group here, the oxygen molecule, and the other methyl group here. And you end up with this with this fuel that liquefies just like propane does, but it burns super duper clean. So it's it's interesting. It's chemically similar to ethanol, but it vaporizes. You can't spill it. It turns into a gas when you do spill it. So this would be something to note. It burns cleanly just like methanol does, but it's a gas instead of a liquid. Um, so how do you how do we end up making methanol carbon neutral? And why should the methanol economy come to reality? Well, this chart has it all. So, this is the Earth's natural aspiration cycle. Okay? The amount that it increases every year, the distance from this top to this top, is the amount of carbon dioxide that mankind adds through fossil fuel use, all right? So we add, oh, about two to three parts per million per year at the measured level, okay? So this is Mauna Loa, I believe that's in Hawaii. And the reason that's kind of significant is that Hawaii is near the equator. It's warm there all year round. And that goes back to physics, okay? If you have water at a specific temperature, you can dissolve salt into the water and measure how much salt is in the water. Once you have reached the solubility limit, no more salt will go into the water. It will just kind of sink to the bottom. Okay? Carbon dioxide dissolves into water the same way. So, that changes the physics of the whole environmental problem that we're looking at. Um, so, we make the argument that fossil fuel is a terrible thing and that combustion is a terrible thing. Okay, well, at the equator near Mauna Loa, where the, wa the water temperature doesn't go up and down. For example, if you dissolve salt into water that's boiling hot, and then you let the water cool down, some of the salt will come out of solution. It will no longer be dissolved in the water. It will sink to the bottom of the glass. That's why if we measure CO2 at the poles, at the North and South Pole, the CO2 will fluctuate even more because the change in water temperature causes CO2 to come in and out of solution for, uh, at a measurable rate. Whereas near the equator, it doesn't change much. So all this oscillation is the plant life on Earth. So if we manage the plant life, then we'll have to burn some of the plant life and be because we burn some of it it goes back into the atmosphere at the same rate as if we had done nothing at all but the difference is we can save some of the plant life as biochar we can convert it to charcoal at an accelerated rate and that is our method of carbon sequestration okay so we have what's called carbon negative methanol. When you take plant mass and pyrolyze it, you can get 20 to 40 percent as a, of biochar as a product. Okay, so effectively, what it does is it changes the amplitude of this wave. It shrinks it down just a little bit. And so, on average, that provides a potential net cooling effect. The potential net cooling effect is interesting because there's less carbon dioxide added, on average, over any given period of time. And so, if less carbon is added, then the global warming is slowed down at a different rate, and it causes 
a moisture pre precipitation event. It would actually cause it potentially to rain more on Earth if we built a methanol economy. Because if we build solar panels and use solar panels for everything and everything is electric, that does absolutely nothing. That does absolutely nothing at all. I rephrase that again. The electric economy does absolutely nothing to fix global warming. And if nothing is done, global warming will continue even after fossil fuel use stops. All right? Think about that. So we have biochar here. Let's get into the chemistry of how biochar works and how renewable methanol works. I want you to look at this piece of wood here. It has all these tiny little cracks and pinholes in it. And if you look at those pinholes under a microscope on wood that has not been pyrolyzed yet, you end up with this structure. This is the open wood grain. These are some of those larger pinholes that you see in the other picture. The smaller pinholes are so small you'd really have to see it under a microscope in order to truly understand what you're dealing with. Okay, so this pyrolyzes into this. And the stuff that we take out of the pyrolysis process is shown in this picture, okay? So by making the methanol economy, we want CH3OH, okay? So you have CH3O there, and then we have an OH here. So we have enough atoms available, enough molecules available to get our CH3OH. And through careful pyrolysis, what, what pyrolysis is, is if you take this and you heat it up with concentrated solar power, it, it's just like making this whole thing out of Legos. You put it in a can and you shake it. You shake it really hard and all these little pieces that stick out will break off. And then the pieces that are more centralized will remain stuck together. The centralized pieces are what turn into charcoal. The pieces that break off are what we use for the methanol economy processes. That's how that works. So this is the plant cell wall. You have this little plant cell here. Well, that's what you're looking at here. That's what this little circle is. Is it's this plant cell wall. Okay. So. This is some of the kind of chemistry that we're dealing with. We're breaking down lignin, hemicellulose, and cellulose with pyrolysis. Pyro, heat, lysis, separation. Okay. Uh, lignin, I believe, is what is making the carbon structure that is charcoal. It, it has all these hexagon rings here. And when you heat them, they degrade and rearrange. Okay? The lignin holds the cellulose together. Again, you have these hexagonal structures. These oxygen molecules can be spalled off and replaced with a carbon molecule, or you are left with five carbon atoms if the oxygen molecule is driven off. And the reason that's significant is that you end up with these structures where some of them have six molecules, some of them have five molecules, and some of them have seven molecules and they can have more molecules it just changes the shape of the structure that's that you're dealing with so we go from this structure that has a bunch of little things stuck to it off we break we break off all the little things and use them for a chemical process and instead of bacteria moving into this structure and entirely converting it to carbon dioxide via the fermentation process we turn it into charcoal just like coal now and we can actually put it back into the coal mines we can actually undo all of the fossil fuel stuff we've done and once co2 is down to a level that we're satisfied with uh we no longer have to sequester that charcoal 
uh, in biochar processes and uh, Superfund site remediation, we can just sell the charcoal and burn it like we've always done. So, there's that. It's kind of how renewable carbon works. Um, with that said, I'd like to thank you for watching this video. If you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the comments. Um, on this channel, I would like to do a portion of scientific stuff. Um, and a lot of it is potentially involved, but highly educational. And then other parts of it are applied. So if I can apply some methanol economy information and some hot rotting information, it provides us a symbiosis of knowledge and the desire to acquire the knowledge. And the desire to acquire knowledge is driven by entertainment and freedom and pleasurability and post-scarcity. So those are things that I see as, as useful. You don't have to listen to what politics tell you what to do or to what someone advertises you to do. Instead, you can start looking at, at how things like the methanol economy are useful to your interests and on an economic basis. You know, if we make everything electric, we won't have gas stations anymore. So people that needed a gas station job can't get the job. So there's that. Uh, anyway, thanks for watching, take care, and stay tuned.